The Good Fight, Hard Lessons from Searchlight to Washington, by Senator Harry Reid, with Mark Warren. Narrated by Kyril D. Plaskon. Preface. I come from a fly speck on the map called Searchlight in remote southern Nevada. Grew up during the war, and I don't mean this as a boast, but people who come from where I come from generally don't end up in the United States Senate. And, in truth, where I've ended up was the furthest thing from my mind as I was getting started. Chapter 1. A Meeting at the White House You should know that these sorts of meetings are typically a waste of time, part of the Kabuki Theater of Washington, full of niceties and platitudes and not much else. Thank you so much for seeing us today, Mr. President. That sort of thing. Fast forward a moment to another day and another meeting, September 11, 2007. I again sat next to the President in the same room, but on this sixth anniversary of the attacks that changed the course of history, the atmosphere in the Cabinet Room was not somber. In fact, on that solemn day, the President was anything but solemn. That day, he wore on his face a look of bravado that we've all come to know, and he said something that I will never have the words to adequately describe. Speaking of the fact that the war was being used by radical Islamists for jihadi recruitment, Bush said, Of course Al-Qaeda needs new recruits, because we're killing them. Then he gave a smirk, that big, bring them all smirk, that we've all come to know. We're killing them all, he said. A few days before in Australia, the president had embarrassed America when he told the deputy prime minister, We're kicking ass, when asked about how things were going in Iraq. With Iraq flowing in blood, both ours and theirs, costing the American taxpayers $12 billion every month, and not getting any closer to resolution. Chapter 2. Searchlight. I come from a mining town, but by the time I came along, December 2, 1939, the leading industry in my hometown of Searchlight, Nevada, was no longer mining. It was prostitution. I don't exaggerate. As a boy, I learned to swim at a whorehouse. Nobody in town had ever seen such a fancy in-ground tiled pool in their lives as the pool at the El Rey, or any pool at all for that matter, at least nobody that we knew. The El Rey was the main bordello where I was growing up in Searchlight. Every Thursday afternoon, the whoremonger in town, a kindly bear of a man by the name of Willie Martello, would ask the girls who worked at the El Rey to clear out, and he'd invite the children in town usually no more than a dozen or so at a time, to swim in his pool. And we would live the life of Riley for a couple of hours, splashing in the azure blue of the whorehouse pool. This was a rare luxury in a hard town. When I was coming up, there were several other brothels in Searchlight, the Crystal Club, Searchlight Casino, Sandy's, 13 in all, and no churches to be found. In my home, we had no religion, none, zero. And when I say none, I don't mean 10% religious. I mean none. It wasn't that my parents were atheists or something. It was that religion just wasn't part of our lives. But Franklin Roosevelt was. In our little home, my mother had a navy blue embroidered pillowcase with a little fringe on it, and she put it up on the wall. On it, in bright yellow stitched, it read, We can, we will, we must. Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And that was my religion. Otherwise, my father's concerns were much more terrestrial, and he spent his time not gazing heavenward, but downward, under the ground, looking for gold. Initially, that was the only reason anybody came to Searchlight. When I was a kid, I didn't realize Searchlight was the middle of nowhere. I figured everybody on Earth lived like we did, and I thought my town was the center of the known universe. The landscape, scarred with hundreds of claims, some active, many abandoned, was so interesting to a boy looking for adventure. All manner of treasure was to be found down those holes, if not actually much gold. Over time, the gold in the ore became harder and harder to find and more expensive to produce. Some of the mining outfits would dig a hole, find nothing there, and immediately dig another hole. And so there are hundreds of holes in the ground in searchlight. Hundreds. Any place you look, there are holes. When I was coming up, people always said, Better be careful of the holes. Better fence some of them. And my dad would say, Anybody dumb enough to fall down a hole, they should fall down a hole. 
During the boom, if a modern convenience existed, it could be found in searchlight. Telephone, telegraph, a doctor, a dentist, a railroad, and electricity, which is astounding, considering that much of rural America wouldn't be electrified for decades. Back then, searchlight was bigger than Las Vegas. When I was a boy, it was barely hanging on. And we knew nothing of the luxuries that those who came before us had enjoyed on the same spot. Searchlight never became a ghost town, but it sure tried. By the 1940s, the town's regression was almost complete. There wasn't a single telephone in the town. No television set, no telegraph, nothing other than the mail to communicate with the outside world. Unreliable electricity. No doctor. No dentist. You didn't go to the doctor unless you were on your deathbed. And even then, who's going to print the money for you to pay the bill? The isolation and dwindling prospects could put a dent in your pioneer spirit and take a toll on your family. Put the lens a little closer on the Reed house. At the time, I thought our house was really nice. But as I look back, uh, I guess it wasn't.